All right, this one's called the Karoo mur murder case. Excuse me, murder case. Nearly a year later, in the month of October 18, London was startled by a crime of singular ferocity and rendered all the more notable by the high position of the victim. The, de the details were few and startling. A maidservant living alone in a house not far from the river had gone upstairs to bed about 11. Although a fog rolled over the city in the small hours, the early part of the night was cloudless, and the lane which the maid's window overlooked was brilliantly lit by the full moon. It seems she was romantically given, for she sat down upon her box, which stood immediately under the window, and fell into a dream of musing. Never, she used to say, was streaming tears when she narrated that experience. Never had she left more at, never more had she felt more at peace with all men, or, or thought more kindly of the world. And as she so sat, she became aware of an aged and beautiful gentleman with white hair drawing near along the light, along the lane, and advancing to meet him, another and a very small gentleman, to whom at first she paid less attention. When they had come within speech, which was just under the maid's eye, the older man bowed and accosted. And, and accosted, A-C-C-O-S-T-E-D, the other with a very pretty manner of politeness. It did not seem as if the subject of his address were of great importance. Indeed, from his pointing, it sometimes appeared as if he were only inquiring his way. But the moon shone on his face as he spoke, and the girl was pleased to watch it. It seemed to breathe such an innocent and old-world kindness of disposition, yet with something high, too, as of a well-founded self-content. Um, as of a well-founded self-content. Presently, her eye wandered to the other, and she was surprised to recognize him in a certain Mr. Hyde, who had once visited her master, for whom she had conceived a dislike. He had in his hand a heavy cane with which he was trifling, but he answered never a word and seemed to listen with an ill contained impatience, and then all of a sudden he broke out into a great flame of anger, stamping with his foot, brandishing the cane, and carrying on, as the maid described it, like a madman. The old gentleman, old gentleman took a step back with the air of one very much surprised and a trifle hurt. At that, Mr. Hyde broke out of all bounds and clubbed him to the earth. And next moment, with ape-like fury, he was trampling his victim underfoot and hailing down a storm of blows, under which the bones were audibly shattered and the body jumped upon the roadway. At the horror of these sights and sounds, the, the maid fainted. It was two o'clock when she came to herself and called the police. The murderer was gone long ago, but there lay his victim in the middle of the lane, incredibly mangled. The stick with which the deed had been done, although it was of some rare and very tough and heavy wood, had broken in the middle under the stress of this insensate cruelty. Insensate? I-N-S-E-N-A, I don't know, I-N-S-E-N-S-A-T-E, -E, cruelty, and one splintered half had rolled in the neighboring gutter. The other, without doubt, had been carried away by the murderer. A purse and a gold watch were found upon the victim, but no cards or papers except a sealed and stamped envelope, which he had been proudly carrying to the post and which bore the name and address of Mr. Utterson. This was brought to the lawyer the next morning before he was out of bed, and he had no sooner seen it and been told the circumstances than he shot out of a solemn lip. I shall say nothing till I have seen the body, said he. This may be very serious. Have the kindness to wait while I dress, and with the same grave countenance he hurried through his breakfast and drove to the police station whither the body had been carried. Whither the body had been uh, W H I T H E R whither the body had been carried. As soon as he came into the cell he nodded. Yes, said he, I recognize him. I'm sorry to say that this is Sir Danvers Carew. Good sir, good God, sir, exclaimed the officer. Is it possible? And the next moment his eyes lighted up with professional ambition. This will make a deal of noise, he said, and perhaps you can help us to the man. And he briefly narrated what the maid had seen and showed the broken stick. Mr. Utterson had already quailed at the name of Hyde, but when the stick was laid before him, he could doubt no longer, broken and battered as it was, he recognized it for one that he had himself presented many years before to Henry Jekyll. Is this Mr. Hyde a person of small stature, he inquired, a particularly small, a particularly wicked looking is what the maid calls him, said the officer. Mr. Utterson reflected and then raising his head, if you will come with me in my cab, he said, I think I can take you to this house. It was by this time about nine in the morning in the first fog of the season. A great chocolate colored uh, a great chocolate colored pall lowered over heaven, P A L L lowered over heaven, but the wind was continually charging and routing these embattled vapors, so that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvelous number of degrees and hues of twilight. H U E S of twilight, for here would be dark like the black end of evening, and there would be a glow of a rich, lurid brown like the light of some strange conflagration. Um, like the light of some strange conflagr conf conflagr con conflagration. 
like the light of some strange conflagration. And here for a moment, the fog would be quite broken up and a haggard shaft of daylight will glance in between the swirling wreaths. The dismal quarter of Soho seen under these changing glimpses with its muddy ways and slatternly passengers and its lamps which had never been extinguished or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion of darkness seemed in the lawyer's eyes like a strict, I don't know, like a district of some city in a nightmare. The thoughts of his mind, besides, were of the gloomiest dye, and when he glanced at the companion of his drive, he was conscious of some touch of that terror of the law and the law's officers, which may at times assail the most honest. <clears throat> As the cab drew up before the address indicated, <clears throat> the fog lifted a little and showed him a dingy street, a gin palace, a low French eating house, a shop for the retail of penny numbers and two penny salads, many ragged children huddled in the doorways, and many women of many different nationalities passing out, key in hand to have a morning glass, and the next moment the fog settled again upon that part as brown umber and cut him off from his black gardenly surroundings. This was a home of Henry Jekyll's favorite, of a man who was heir to a quarter of a million sterling. An ivory-faced and silvery-haired old woman opened the door. She had an evil face, smoothed by hypocrisy, but her manners were excellent. Yes, she said, this was Mr. Hyde's, but he was not at home. He has been in that night very late. He had been in that night very late, but had gone away again in less than an hour. So he came in late and gone in less than an hour. There was nothing strange in that. His habits were very irregular. And he was often absent, for instance. It was nearly two months since she had seen him till yesterday. Very well, then. We wish to see his rooms, said the lawyer. And when the woman began to declare it was impossible, I'd better tell you who this person is, he added. This is Inspector Newcomen of Scotland Yard. A flash of odious joy appeared upon the woman's face. Ah, said she. He is in trouble. What has he done? Mr. Utterson and the inspector exchanged glances. He don't seem a very popular character, observed the latter. And now, my good woman, just let me and this gentleman have a look about us. And the whole extent of the house, which, but for the old women, remained otherwise empty. Mr. Hyde had only used a couple of rooms, but these were furnished with luxury and good taste. The closet was filled with wine. The plate was of silver, the, the napery elegant. A good picture hung upon the walls, a gift, as Utterson supposed, from Henry Jekyll, who was much of a connoisseur. And the carpets, the carpets were of many plies and agreeable in color. At this moment, however, the rooms bore every mark of having been recently and hurriedly ransacked. Clothes lay about the floor with their pockets inside out. Lock fast drawers stood open, and on the hearth there lay a pile of gray ashes as though many papers had been burned. From the embers, the inspector dis, disinterred the butt end of a green checkbook, which had resisted the action of the fire. The other half of the stick was found behind the door, and as this clinched his suspicions, the officer declared himself delighted. A visit to the bank where several thousand pounds were found to be lying to the murderer's credit completed his gratification. You made a pen upon it, sir, he told Mr. Utterson. I have him in my hand. He must have lost his head or he never would have left the stick or above all burned the checkbook. Why, money's life to the man. We have nothing to do but wait for him at the bank and get out the handbills. This last, however, was not so easy of accomplishment for Mr. Hyde had numbered few familiars. Even the master of the servant maid had only seen him twice. His family could nowhere be traced for Mr. Hyde had numbered few familiars. Oh, like, I thought he called few people he knew but had numbered few familiars. Like, he didn't have many, not many people knew about him. Even the master of the servant maid had only seen him twice. His family could uh, could nowhere be traced he had never been photographed and the few who could describe him differed widely as common observers will only on one point where they agreed that that was the haunting sense of unexpressed deformity with which the fugitive impressed his beholders <laughs> peace y'all that was the end of that one